Uh, Alice, you might be the only one, uh, but just let us know if you're in your annex when it comes to you. Thank you. Senator Gardler. Here. Senator Carr. Can't hear you. Senator Carr, your mic is muted. I'm here in my annex office. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Senator McDaniel. Here. Senator Mills. Senator Mills. Here. Senator Southworth. Here. Senator Storm. Here. Senator Thomas. Here. Senator Wheeler. Here. Senator Wilson. Here. Senator Yates. Here. Chairman Schroeder. I am here and we do have a quorum. We are going to proceed and we will start with Senate Bill 5. I see the Senate President is here and ready. Members, we do have a sub. I believe that's already in your folder. Do apologize. That was there's a little bit of miscommunication. Uh, that was sent, I think, early this morning. It will be my preference uh, going forward that everyone has that uh, the evening before. So I do apologize. Uh, Senate President, would you like us to take action on the substitute or? I think Senator Gerber, Chairman, was going to offer the committee sub. Uh, so I'll move to on the committee sub. All those in favor of adopting the sub, please signal by saying aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Sub is adopted. Please. If I can take my mask off. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. We cannot. I cannot hear the testimony table. Can you now? Yes. I have my Thank microphone you. on. Sorry about that, Senator Kerr. I would. I would say for. Mr. Chairman, you're probably not old enough to remember this, but looking at Senator Kerr, you might want to pull the camera down because you remind me of Kilroy in World War II because all you can see is the top of your eyes. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Senate Bill 5, we've talked about this before. Uh, it's directly related to covid and what has happened, we attempted to fashion a remedy that would apply in any emergency situation, uh, but came to the conclusion, and that's what the committee subs does, is specifically apply it to this situation. Um, and in the discussions we've had before, you know, we tried to draft it broad enough, thinking about long-term policy, uh, thinking about the ice storms that happen, that you'll have different groups of people that may be defined essential in an ice storm versus something that is related to a public health matter versus something that could happen uh, where you have something of a contaminant that gets released in a water system. All of a sudden, truck drivers, pipe fitters may become um, uh, the individuals who are defined as uh, essential. And you know, so we, we just backed it down to this because this is something we know, this is something we've lived with and those who would be defined essential and the special needs for those manufacturers um, to be brought in under the umbrella of uh, the state. Um, and a little bit of history, most of the corrections or amendments to um, 39A uh, that were done in the early 2000s were related to uh, or in reaction to 9-11. And so you can see how that would be a totally different set of facts than this. So in the committee sub, we limit it to just COVID related incidences. We then tried to kind of change around to uh, make sure that those individuals that would be essential were covered, but then just reference them back to the governor's order. Uh, so it would again be specific and if something like this which i hope nothing ever like this happens again um, that we may have to look at a different response and different legislation and through this process and again i'm assuming that everybody recalls earlier in the session when we talked about this i think senator wheeler raised an issue that some people may be given um, the blankets of immunity um, and and of the sovereign and 
liability protections when they're actually defined as essential but doing an activity that is not related to the function for which they were declared to be essential. So we tighten that language up. Um, so we, we've listened to try to come through with all the various scenarios, which are tough, to create a bill that would ultimately give protections to those individuals that are operating within whatever guidelines may be in existence at the time. Everybody on the committee is aware that we've had World Health Organization guidelines, we've had CDC guidelines, we've had things from the governor's office, the coronavirus task force, and it's become difficult. Now, we're trying to do those protections. And for those entities that have been uh, brought into the mix, uh, to give them that umbrella of the sovereign. So that's the substance of PSS 1, uh, Committee Substitute 2, underlying bill of Senate Bill 5. Uh, I think most people have had this out. There's not a lot of technical corrections from what their bill originally was, but that's the bill. Thank you, Mr. President. And as the uh, president mentioned, and I'll remind not necessarily our members, but anyone watching, uh, we did have this before the committee early in January uh, for an informational hearing. At the time, we do have um, someone who wants to testify. So members, it'd be my preference now to hear from that person, and then we will open it up for questions. I believe we have the link, uh, Jay Vaughn, Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Jay. We can hear you loud and clear if you want to proceed. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Jay Vaughn, I'm a lawyer here in Louisville, uh, speaking on behalf of Kentucky Justice Association. I appreciate you all taking the time. When we had the uh, the meetings earlier in January that um, Mr. Chairman just referenced, uh, I spoke at that point. Um, and uh, President Stivers, uh, I think, recently had um, made some remarks or spoken to the chamber, and we want to at least say that, you know, he, I agree, we agree with President Stiver's comments that if someone, the business is operating the best they can um, and they are complying with the guidelines and the protocols in place, um, that they shouldn't be sued for that. I mean, I think that we can all agree with that. I think this bill goes a little further than that. Um, uh, a concern we have is the statute of limitation concerns. We, we appreciate President Stiver's did uh, make some amendments and add in that motor, that you know, motor vehicles, um, the statute under the MVRA will apply where before that wasn't specifically mentioned and there was some vagueness. We appreciate that. The concern is there's other types of claims that can be made under this bill, not just injury, but property claims. And there's some statutes for property claims that are five years. Um, and the way this bill is read, it could potentially make those one year um, and shorten the current statute of limitations on property type cases. So that's a concern. Um, I think also is the, for, for any, most cases we have, personal injury, property, I mean, usually we go under a general negligence standard um, and the bill actually increases a standard of care to, um, you know, a gross negligence, willful, wanton standard. Um, and on the essential service side, I believe it's paragraph seven, um, the concern on the essential service side isn't necessarily the part where it says essential services related to but it actually goes on to add or impacted by the declared emergency. And I'm just abbreviating, says saying COVID and everything else, I'm saying declared emergency, but impacted by. I mean, everyone's been impacted by. So if you're an essential service, you've been impacted by, um, then you know there's really an argument that you don't have any liability but for a willful, wanton, reckless type conduct. So if, again, if it's someone who's operating, um, you know, uh, if, if at the time a, um, a beer delivery service or, or bars or consider essential service and a beer truck's, you know, driving down the road and runs into a building um, and injures, let's say, the owner of that building in there um, or another customer, then unless it's gross negligence, willful, wanton, intentional conduct, um, you know, if it's an essential service and they're impacted by the emergency, then they don't really have any reliability, not just for the injury or potential death claim, but for the actual property owner that would be damaged by that. Um, so I think that's a concern with the reading of the bill. Um, 
And that's really where it comes down to. I think there's a lot of broadness and vagueness in it. Um, like I said, the MVRA was added back in. That's good. But I think there's some other statute of limitation concerns. And our, the biggest issue we have is the heightening or raising of the standard of care from a regular reasonable person negligence standard to a gross negligence intentional standard. Um, but with that, I'm, I'm happy to field any questions. But I want to keep this short um, since we you know, spoke on this before. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. Uh, Senator President, if, if you wish, I'll give you a second. I don't know if you want to just open it up for questions or respond. You know, um, on, on mirroring the statute limitations, I really don't see that there's a big problem in mirroring the statute limitations uh, on property claims, but I don't think property claims are really the big issue in this uh, and where potential uh, substantial damages are. The impacted by on the essential services there may be some potential to tighten that language up. Um, and that is similar, something that I think Senator Wheeler talked about um, when you want to make sure it is related to the declaration of the individual's essential status. So um, again, that's part of the process. I think uh, we can look certain on the property claim that I can attach a floor amendment to clear, clarify that. Uh, but then I want to have to take a little bit more on the impacted by to see how we can draft if there is something. I'm not sure, but I understand the rationale there. Thank you. We have questions and I'm going to start with Senator McDaniel. Mr. Chair, I'll just make a quick statement here. Um, you know, we kind of, in, in our line of work, we joke that, uh, any vehicle inspector can find a problem with a commercial vehicle. Um, I think the same applies here that uh, any of our attorney friends can find a problem with the bill. Um, and as dearly as we love what they're doing, I wanna put everybody in the shoes of somebody who's an employer and who provides services that stay open through the pandemic. When you're, when literally on a Sunday afternoon, you're sitting there and there are changes that have been made either federally or at the state level, and at six o'clock on Monday morning, you have 40 some people due to show up for work. And you have to decide quickly based off of that guidance and knowing by the way, that since these folks don't are technically still deemed essential, they don't qualify for the pandemic, pandemic unemployment benefits and the things that are there. Okay. And so you have to make this decision. Do we bring these guys in here in 18 hours or not? And then how does that play out particularly also as it relates to certain contractual obligations that we have to perform on job sites and you're doing your best in these cases to make these decisions very quickly you don't have the benefit of warm conference rooms and nine months of hindsight to make those decisions you're just doing the best with what you've got right then. And in my case, when you then go into the shop where you thought you were setting up for the company meeting the next morning, and instead you're teaching yourself how to use iMovie so that you can record a video to send to your employees, life has changed very quickly and your decisions have to be made very quickly and they carry a tremendous amount of impact. And I'm just a, another guy who employs 40 folks and we go about our way. But there's thousands of us across this state that did the best we could, you know, and there's some exclusions in here for people that were, you know, remember the term, grossly negligent or willfully or intentionally. But I mean, you, you're literally doing the best you can. You're, you know, you're going out and buying bottles of Dawn to put in the truck. You're buying sprayers to put alcohol in to spray off shovels and concrete floats and such. Trying to make the best decisions you can. We didn't have the benefit of hindsight as we approached this. A lot of us just did the best we could to balance health, to balance income, to balance contractual obligations. And this is a good measure to say, hey, we recognize what you did. And if you were a good faith operator, we're going to take care of you. So I, I would move for approval, Mr. Chairman. I know we'll have more uh, questions and comments. Thank you. We do have a motion. We're going to wait. We do have more questions. We have a second. So we do have a motion and a second. 
Uh, next up, we have uh, Senator Wheeler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I would like to start by stating that, uh, you know, I, I do sympathize with, with, with uh, Senator McDaniel's statements. I mean, they, they do represent a, a valid concern for our business owners across the Commonwealth. Uh, and I have concern for those business owners, owners too. And, you know, I, I guess one of the concerns I have is, is both an attorney, I, I have concerns about the individual, uh, but I also have concern about business. And I, I've had this discussion with, with Senator Stivers, and I, and I think, um, you know, Jay Vaughn, and, you know, if this bill passes, and, and you know, it may well pass out of committee today and, and, and pass the Senate floor, in order to, let's just say somebody walks into my office and has a, a COVID claim. Um, you know, there's been a lot of people that have bought insurance to cover, you know, virus exposure and things like that. And, and right now we have numerous claims in court where, uh, you know, uh, businesses who pop purchased virus coverage, uh, the insurance companies are trying to deny that coverage and don't want to give them, um, you know, extend to them the benefits that they paid good money for. One fear that I have that could happen here is that if I get a COVID claim as an attorney and if I was to make that claim in court, I would have to allege gross negligence, recklessness, wanton behavior. Uh, otherwise, according to this bill, the judge would issue summary judgment and throw me out. Uh, if I allege those actions, uh, many policies, in fact, most policies have an exclusion for willful, wanton, reckless behavior, meaning there is no coverage. So what would likely happen in that scenario, just like these insurance companies who don't want to pay out virus coverage, they're probably going to hire you a lawyer to, to, to answer the complaint, but at the same time, they're probably going to hire another lawyer to sue you sue you in what's called a declaratory judgment action to say, hey, look at uh, page 16, paragraph 64, subsection G of this contract, and I use that merely as a, um, that is an example, no, no actual point of reference. Willful, wanton, and reckless acts are excluded. We don't want to cover uh, McD Concrete for this lawsuit, we think that we should have, uh, you know, he, we should get a judgment saying there's no coverage. Um, you know, they may very well win that declaratory judgment action, and then you're in a situation where you don't have insurance, you have an attorney, you have no representation at that point unless you want to pay for that out of your own pocket. Um, you know, I think in many ways this potentially exposes small businesses to um, more liability in certain cases of uh, reckless or wanton behavior, if in fact that that is what is proven. And you know, I want to give uh, protections to businesses, but I want to give real protections to business that uh, not that, that, that appropriately balances the need to give those protections with the rights of the individual under the Kentucky Constitution. So. I do have some concerns about this bill. I have expressed them to the President Stivers, who I will say has made a lot of good faith efforts to try to get this legislation um, uh, in a better place. And I do think it is in a better place, but, it, but you know, I think it still has some significant uh, problems that, um, you know, that not only could hurt individuals, but could actually hurt business in some, some circumstances. So. Uh, I just, um, and Senator Stivers, if you would have anything to say to kind of the scenario that I, that I gave there. Well, I'm, Mr. Chairman, sorry, I've always known to go through the chair. Uh, it's an interesting set of facts that Senator Wheeler puts forward uh, because what Senator McDaniel speaks of, I think, is totally separate and distinct. And I'm very familiar with what Senator Wheeler says about you'll have two pieces of litigation. One, where the insurance company, and I'm sure that Senator Gerder is well aware of this, they defend with a reservation of rights. 
saying that if the area is proven to be negligence, that um, they will have coverage and provide you counsel as part of their contract. And the allegation then of some, that's if there is in this situation what the allegations are, then there is the other, which I think more is the first being uh, what Senator McDaniel talks about, somebody that has gone out and done something that is willful or gross deviation of the standard of care, um, if that occurs in any situation, whether this is in place or not, that's going to be part of the Declaration of Rights because that is going to be what the litigation is for in the DEC action. And that's what it, we'll call it in our profession, the DEC action. Say, well, this is not just negligence, which we cover, and this happens today. This, there's an allegation that this will be gross negligence. And if a jury or, and it would have to be a jury or a, if a bench trial uh, were to concur, conclude with them finding because my brethren will always put in there both negligence and gross negligence. Everything will be pleaded. <laughs> uh, and so it will still trigger a declaration of rights action because they're going to say if it is just a finding of negligence, then you have coverage. If it's gross negligence under the DEC action, you don't have coverage. So the, the, the whole thing about this then is not that the entity is not being protected. They're being protected for that which we recognize they should be protected for. On the other side, if there is some type of willful, and, and I've actually seen this, in a criminal prosecution, family members have asked us to make sure that it is a reckless homicide, not an intentional act, so they can then sue for wrongful death. It doesn't preclude people from a judgment and potential compensation. It just won't come from an insurance policy. Senator Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I have a question for President Stivers. President Stivers, I do want to go back to, to paragraph 7 uh, that was alluded to by, by Jay when he made his presentation. <sighs> My question to you is, excuse me, paragraph seven or section seven? Section seven, page okay. four. Okay, I, I, you said paragraph and I wanted to catch it. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, page four, um, I, I guess that's subparagraph seven, line 10. Page four, line 10, uh, beginning of, of uh, subsection seven. I'm on, the I'm on the committee substitute. Yeah, and I don't have the committee substitute in front of me. I didn't have it in my package. Beginning those persons providing essential services related to or impacted by the SARS COVID uh, hyphen two pandemic. Are, are you there? I am. Okay. okay. One of the problems that I have with this bill and, and, and help me understand it is that what this bill says is that during the course of the pandemic and extending one year after the emergency, those individuals uh, shall not be liable except in cases of, of willful, gross negligence, or intentional conduct for the death of, or injury of a person, damage to property, or any other harm uh, related thereto. And, and I'm just confused, and I guess that's the proper word I can use, President Stivers. I'm just confused as why are we extending this to one year after the emergency is withdrawn? Uh, because to me, the intent of this, the, the intent of your legislation, proposed legislation, has always been to cover those businesses during an emergency, you know, during the time when we have this, this crisis that's before us. It seems to me that, that this goes way too far because you're also insulating people from liability who could do damage after the, the order is now expired. And yet, if within that one year period, now they're subject to a higher standard of care than they ordinarily would be. So I, 
why wouldn't we just cut it off at the time the emergency was drawn? That would make more sense to me. Mr. Chair. Senator Thomas, um, let me give you an analogy that's not quite on this, but it will give individuals an understanding. At the close of year calendar year 2020, I will say that I'm an insurance recipient or a Medicaid recipient, and I had a procedure performed on me at the doctor's office. It happened in calendar year 2020, but it won't really be dealt with from a payment standpoint for maybe six or eight months. There will be things that could occur prior to the declaration of the emergency being over that will not take place in the period of time from when the declaration was given and the declaration was withdrawn or declared over that will still lag just as there is a lagging Medicaid claim or a lagging insurance claim that will be outside of the defined period of the emergency. And that's what this language is to deal with because I could actually contract COVID, be one of the last people, I didn't take my shot, something like that, but there will still people be dealing with COVID implications and residuals beyond the declared period of the emergency. And that's why the extension. Thank you. I'm going to move on. Senator Yates has a question. After that, Senator Mills is going to have a question. And then, members, I'm going to have to cut it off, uh, unfortunately, because we do have two other bills. But for now, Senator Yates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Mr. President, if, if I may, and, um, I appreciate the uh, amendment the uh, before us today. And I've been trying my best to read through it. I got this morning. Um, Last time we testified and, and we discussed, uh, I think it was really clear, and I, and I believe it still is, that there was no intention here to give immunity to non-COVID-related negligence. Was that, does everybody agree that, and, and so um, as I'm hearing people say, well, this, is, this, this may be pretty good, this does something, in the event that what we have before us gives immunity to non-COVID-related negligence, we still have a problem. And I have to believe that the people in this room can fix that. And I know that um, the scenario that Mr. Vaughn gave and that we was given last time, um, it's a scenario that I see in my law office a lot. You know, you, you have the truck driver, you have the individual that may be delivering goods um, that, that is for essential for a service. Um, let's say it's liquor. We, we felt that was an essential service or it's hand sanitizer or whatever it is. Not Somebody liquor. thought it was an essential service. I'm not going to necessarily say I thought it was an essential service. <laughs> so, so the beer truck or the hand sanitizer truck, it's driving in. Um, and that individual is negligent. And he hits my family. He, I'm crippled, maybe mentally disabled, whatever it is afterwards, I can't work anymore. Um, my firstborn child um, maybe need a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of surgeries. Um, and otherwise, her quality of life is gone. Same thing with the baby. Um, normally, there's insurance because the truck driver pays a policy of insurance that covers for negligence. If he's negligent, um, he's not reckless, he's not willful, he didn't decide to hit his head on, he was negligent. Um, and we have this in place. As written, are we, and re really what we're doing is we're, we're relieving the insurance company of paying that sums out. But, but in this, with this cover, as it's rewritten, um, that situation with that truck driver who is delivering those essential goods, who takes his eye off the road and destroys my family, destroys my life. Um, are we relieving them from liability and even the insurance company from having to pay that out and ultimately putting that burden on all the Kentucky families? Um, or have we fixed that to the point that that would finally be covered? Would we put that negligence back into it? Well, I'm going to say that this is probably going to be a question of fact of now that we have said it's related to the definition of what essential is. I used, I think Ms. Senator Wheeler talked about if somebody blows through a stop sign and hits you, is that negligent when they are a doctor defined as essential? Well, you know, that all depends on the fact specific situation. So I'm not going to be able to say yes on this. I'm not going to be able to say no because we can set up a fact-specific situation that it probably would or would not apply. 
if I may just follow on that, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Very, very briefly. Okay. Um, I have a case right now, an ambulance driver. Same thing. They're driving an ambulance. They blew through and they hurt a, a family. Um, it, you look at it totality of the circumstances. Were they negligent in the totality of the circumstances? If they were, there's liability. If there's not, they weren't. Um, would, would, Mr. President, would you agree that if someone is negligent in the totality of the circumstances with COVID, providing essential circumstances, there should be um, that immunity um, shouldn't have been put in place, and that, that it, the burden shouldn't be on the family. Can we can we fix that to, to address that? Well, I think your burden of proof is always going to be on the plaintiff that is their duty and obligation to prosecute the claim as to totality of the circumstances i'm not going to agree or disagree with you because i think it depends upon what the facts are and if you have somebody who is sitting there in the scope of their employment that's defined as essential that decides to go off of uh, of, of the parameters and do something I think that goes back to what Senator Wheater said. It's not within the scope of what they were going to do. Now, here you have the ambulance driver. You have somebody that's in a life-threatening position that time is of the essence to get them to a hospital to either do stroke protocols or it's been a massive heart attack. So naturally, you're going to expect the ambulance driver to speed. That is a justification, and there's actually jury instructions that talk about justification that you are justified to break laws choice of evils defense and so then it comes down to was that justified and so that all goes back to uh the circumstances i can create circumstances that would take it outside of this realm i can create circumstances that will be in the realm that's going to be a question of fact that a judge and a jury based on law and facts will then have to determine. Senator Mills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, more of a statement to try to just get us focused here before we vote. You know, we are, we are dealing, I'm a small business guy and I'm gonna tag along with what Senator McDaniels said. You know, we've got businesses that are limping by losses of 30, 40%. Uh, we need to build their confidence. We need to give them stable footing, give them some assurances that they're gonna get back to their uh, normal business environment. I think this uh, bill builds that confidence and it's, it's very much needed. It takes something off of a small business guy's plate that he's uh, worried about, lets him you know, contend with the normal risk that he has every day. Uh, I think when we remove uh, and give him more confidence, his, his business is going to do better. He's going to hire more people in our economy. Is going to get back to uh, pre, you know, pre-COVID uh, levels. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd ask for you to vote for this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mills. Uh, members, I think we've had a good discussion. I'm a little disappointed uh, personally that KT isn't here because I think it's a a worthy discussion to get out to constituencies, uh, constituencies, our businesses, uh, et cetera, and get feedback on this. But we do have a motion from Senator Chris McDaniel, and we had a second from Senator Girdler. And at this time, I would ask that we go ahead and take this vote. Please call the. Senator Girdler. Uh, aye. Senator Carr. Aye. Senator McDaniel. Aye. Senator Mills. Senator Southworth. Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Please do. Um, I'm gonna vote no. I do appreciate some of the changes that have happened so far in this bill. I feel like um, we might be a snail pace, but we might be getting somewhere where we need to be going. Um, the, there's really two different pieces of this. The one is premises liability and removing the duty of care of a business to you know make itself a sterile location, which I totally agree with. Um, the other piece is identifying people that are essential and handing them certain privileges that other people don't have. And as I'm looking through this list, you know, I, I do see food on the list, so that's good. I remember the shelves were bare on food, but I also don't see toilet paper manufacturing on the list. That was another item that I think a lot of people considered pretty essential. Um, certain things we just always are missing, and it goes back to the issue of, you know, who should be covered and who shouldn't. I don't think we should be necessarily picking winners and losers of all the different types of businesses that we have. Um, I almost wonder if we couldn't just have a one-liner that says, you know, our goal, which I think all of us could agree with, that our government that's made certain decisions needs to stand behind their decisions and make a one-liner that employees or businesses.
viruses aren't the source of COVID and anybody that thinks otherwise or tries to challenge it, well, sorry about your luck or something like that, um, might be a cleaner way to address this. So I look forward to uh, working on this more, and but for now, I am voting no. Senator Storm. I'd like to vote and explain my vote, please. Please do. I've heard from a lot of, well, I'd like to vote uh, yes for today's purposes in the committee. Uh, if this goes onto the floor, I may, in, in fact, vote no. Uh, I think that we have good dialogue. I appreciate uh, the witnesses that have testified here today. I think there's a lot of concerns from my perspective uh, and my constituents that they do want to have their businesses back open. But again, I think some of these issues as it relates to statute limitations and uh, changing the negligence standard are concerns for me. And I also think we have House Bill 10, which is a pretty good uh, bill right now. So again, I would uh, uh, rest on that. Thank you. Senator Thomas. Michelle, I'd like to explain my no vote. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To begin with, I would have to say I'm certainly opposed to raising the standard of care uh, uh, in this bill. Uh, going back to uh, my colleague, Senator McDaniels, and, and his, his uh, uh, explanation as to why he favored the bill, uh, he used the term good faith. And under current law, you know, good faith is equivalent to reasonable care. Uh, and so if a person in Senator McDaniel's position, a business owner, exercised good faith to try to comply with regulations that just came down the, uh, the night before, they would meet the standard of care now currently in existence under well-established tort law because they would be acting as a reasonable person in, in the circumstances that a reasonable person would act. So Senator Daniels uh, uh, and persons like him would be protected. But... With regard to the question I asked President Stivers, I just don't understand why a person was, why we would still have a higher standard of duty for a period of 12 months after the emergency had withdrawn. Once the emergency was withdrawn, there is no emergency after that. And the explanation I received about how some things don't manifest to six or eight to months later really goes more to a limitation period in my mind. Uh, rather than a justification for extending per, a higher de degree of care for one year period. Um, and so therefore, uh, in my reading of this bill uh, uh, is just inconsistent with the, the approach I think we should provide protections to people in an emergency as serious as COVID-19. Therefore, I vote no. Senator Wheeler. Mr. Chairman, explain my vote. Please proceed. Uh, I'm going to vote no. Uh, with respect, I do want to applaud President Stivers for, for making efforts to make this, uh, this legislation more palatable. Uh, however, I, I share many of the concerns expressed by Senator Storm and Senator Thomas. Um, I, I think we do, uh, I think that Senator Thomas is correct that uh, given Senator McDaniel's um, hypothetical scenario, I think that if he acted reasonably in accordance to the guidelines that uh, current Kentucky law does uh, give businesses protection in those circumstances. And I do have some concern that this goes too far and in fact could potentially um, put certain small businesses uh, in a position where they would not have coverage or they may be fighting with their insurance company to obtain coverage. So, um, you know, I, I, and, and to also mention something that Senator Storm stated, uh, there is House Bill 10 out here, which I do think is a more appropriate mechanism to deal with these types of uh, situations. So um, I do vote no, but, uh, you know, I do appreciate the work that's gone to make this bill uh, better than the initial draft. Senator Wilson. I vote aye. Senator Yates. Chair, explain my vote, please. Please. I vote no. Um, first, thank you, the President, to uh, continue this discussion. Uh, I do think, colleagues, that we can do better and that if our purpose here is to not to give immunity to non-COVID related negligence, if that is the purpose, then we can achieve that. And we will have to play with the fact scenarios and we'll have to look because these are real Kentuckians that are going to be affected. And if we can come up with those scenarios, we need to make sure they fall within the guidelines here. And so um, with that, I vote no, but um, with the hope uh, that we'll continue to get better legislation. Chairman Schroeder. Thank you. I'm going to vote aye. 
Uh, like my colleague Senator Storm mentioned, I, I too have some concerns. I think some have been aired uh, here today. Uh, Senator McDaniel made the comment about uh, attorneys. He recently just finished a book about Kirk Kikorian, who was an eighth grade dropout turned billionaire. One of his uh, favorite saying was, don't let the attorneys mess this up. So I think that, you know, sometimes we have a different perspective and certainly try our best to get things right. Um, in normal circumstances, I think there would be some constitutional questions I have, but these certainly aren't normal circumstances for us, for businesses out there, for our constituents. I share Senator Wheeler's concern uh, with heightening the standard that uh, we could potentially have businesses with insurance companies that uh, are removed from the case, walk free, and they're left trying to defend this action. I've personally reached out to some businesses that have contacted me to ask them about those policies. I look forward to hearing back from them. And again, I'm a little disappointed that KET is not here because I'd love to, the more feedback I think, the better on bills like this. But for today, I vote aye and bill does pass with uh, seven yes votes and it looks like four no votes. So Mr. President, congratulations, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I ask Chair, what bill are you gonna take up next? Do you have a preference? I mean, if you, if I you, think you have Senator Mills' pneumoconiosis bill, which I've been intricately involved in and told him I would be here. Be happy to. We'll go ahead. So, members, that's 141. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of committee. Uh, we're looking at Senate Bill 141, and at the table, obviously, we have President Stivers to my left and to my right, Ms. Allison Smith with uh, Kimi, and she's here to answer all the hard questions. <laughs> but uh, Senate Bill, uh, Senate Bill uh, 141 is is kind of a cleanup of uh, one, uh, 263 that Senator Wheeler did uh, last year. Uh, and it involved uh, Kimi returning excess uh, co-worker pneumoconiosis uh, funds back to the coal operators. Uh, just to give you a real quick overview, 2017, when I first came in the legislature, one of the first things we did was to try to help uh, the struggling coal industry, and we uh, moved these funds over to Kimi for them to uh, administer. Uh, as of today, uh, all the claims in this, uh, in this fund are fully paid and approximately $20 million are left in excess funds. The challenge here that we're gonna to address today with this bill is after uh, 263 was passed and uh, there came up, they, they determined that there was about, there's two claims that were found to be pending. And these claims, uh, probably two to three years uh, before they can be settled. So uh, Kimmy can't, distribute the funds back to the coal operators, the excess funds, until final audits and litigation is uh, ended. So uh, 141 here gives uh, a remedy, uh, gives some flexibility to uh, Kimmy to be able to uh, assess the, the two, uh, two or three claims that are left, set aside funds, and uh, let the excess funds be initially distributed back to the coal operators uh, as of right now. So uh, really just kind of a clean up on last year's bill. Uh, and uh, I would ask if you have any questions, we'd be happy to uh, answer them. We do have one from Senator Wheeler. Uh, it's more of a comment, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, this is good legislation. I mean, I probably practice as much black lung law in the coal fields as anybody in this room. Um, I think what Senator Mills is essentially saying, and we discussed this last year, is that th these are essentially legacy claims, meaning there will be no more claims made on this fund. And so in, in, in the legislation that we passed last year, Senate Bill 263, is one of those very few instances that I think you could really call it win-win legislation, that not only does it help the coal industry by releasing these funds, which we were obligated to do per statute, 
anyway uh, to, to assist a struggling industry, which is struggling even more considering some of the recent uh, executive orders that we've seen coming out of Washington. Uh, we also are helping coal miners by uh, taking the unclaimed funds and placing those uh, to help shore up the um, Kentucky Coal Producer Self-Insurance Fund. So the unclaimed funds will actually go to pay miners' claims. So we are helping an industry that has been very uh, important to Kentucky historically. We're also helping coal miners. So this is a good bill. Uh, I encourage everybody on this committee to vote for it and to uh, pass this out with favorable expressions. So Thank I you, Senator Wheeler. We do have a motion from Senator Gerler. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second, Senator Wheeler. Uh, Senator Mills, if I were to ask you to spell every word in the title, <laughs> would you be able to do so? I'd have to reflect <laughs> on my notes probably okay. twice. <laughs> Sounds good. Good answer. At that, Madam, uh, if you would, please go ahead and call the roll. Senator Gardler. Thanks. Aye. Senator Carr. Aye. Senator McDaniel. Aye. Senator Mills. Aye. Senator Southworth? Aye. Senator Storm? Aye. Senator Thomas? Aye. Senator Wheeler? Aye. Senator Wilson? Senator Wilson? Aye. Senator Yates? Aye. Yeah. Chairman Schroeder? I vote aye as well. We do have a, a motion for consent. I think at this time we will go ahead and put it on if leadership decides that, if, if, as long as that's okay with the bill sponsor. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. We have a, a motion. Do we have a second for consent calendar? Senator Storm, a second. All those in favor of adding to consent, please signal by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It will be on consent unless leadership decides otherwise. Thank you for being here. We appreciate if questions had come up, we appreciate you being here. So next up, Senator Carroll with Senate Bill 49. Please come to the table. This is, uh, I'll remind members, um, at least some of this discussion, if not all the discussion and subject matter was heard and debated. I believe it was September 24th of the interim. Uh, there was a committee meeting. I actually went back to watch that, and unfortunately, KET cut off before uh, the presentation, but there were some good notes on it and a good PowerPoint presentation. So with that, Senator Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and that was kind of my opening that this was a, a meeting uh, during the interim with this committee that we discussed uh, this issue. Uh, Commissioner Swisher was present that day. We also had a representative from Kimmy and ClearPath. And uh, during that discuss discussion, the commissioner clarified to us that uh, as a legislature, we had the right to address workers' comp issues as we saw fit. And uh, that response was in relation to uh, concerns about some problems we had had about uh, 1915C waiver providers in the, st in the state. And as you all are aware, these are providers that provide uh, HCB, Michelle P, SCL type services for, for those with uh, physical intellectual disabilities uh, throughout our state. And the problem that we had is that our uh, workers' comp uh, providers, carriers, were indiscriminately and inconsistently uh, during annual audits coming in and specifying certain uh, independent contractors that these providers use uh, that they would then fall under workers' comp. No rhyme, no reason. Uh, conversations throughout the state, one program uh, they would require it, the next one they wouldn't. So. Uh, the idea was to address that, and uh, with Commissioner Swisher's um, input into that, uh, we decided to file legislation to exempt uh, these independent contractors uh, from workers' comp and also from, from unemployment, which, which is standard. So please understand that the entire uh, purpose of this bill is to protect the status quo uh, within the state so there is consistency and these are true independent contractors who uh, oftentimes work for different providers. So they're under that definition, uh, they, they definitely do fit that. And I'm gonna hand this over uh, to Amy, and I didn't introduce myself. My name is Danny Carroll, I'm the State Senator for the 2nd District. I apologize, and Amy, I'll yield the floor to you. Hi, um, 
Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for letting me be here today to testify in support of Senate Bill 49. Uh, my name is Amy Stade. I am the Executive Director of the Kentucky Association of Private Providers. As Senator Carroll said, um, we are a trade association who represents providers of important support services for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, these are Medicaid-funded services. Um, this bill, if passed, will allow certain very specific independent contractors to remain independent contractors. Um, it will not all of a sudden change any employees over to an independent contractor. It just, as Senator Carroll said, maintains the status quo. It's important that these workers be able to remain independent contractors just due to the nature of the services they provide. Um, they need that flexibility. They want and need to be able to, to contract with many different um, provider service organizations. And um, it's important that the autonomy remain that exists as, um, as a result of the independent contractor relationship. Um, just to be clear again, this bill won't affect any covered employees. It just simply exempts um, independent contractors who have always been exempt from workers' comp and unemployment coverage. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone has them. Thank you, Senator Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, may I ask, uh, I didn't catch Amy's last name. Stay. My I ask Ms. State two questions, Mr. Chair? Thank you. Ms. State, my first question to you is this. With respect to 1915C providers, okay, such as yourself, does the 1915 provider, with respect to those individuals who provide behavior support service, I want to make sure I get this right, behavior support services, behavior programming services, provide case management services, community living support services, positive behavior support services, or respite services through a contractual relationship. Yeah. Does the 1915C provider have the ability to dictate the hours and time in which those persons work? May I respond? Uh, generally speaking, the, with these services and these kinds of uh, contracts, one, that's going to be dictated by the contract, and two, oftentimes these workers arrange with the individual themselves, the individual with the disability, they work that out between the two of them. So the behavior specialist, for example, will call the individual with the disability and say, what days a week would you like to receive these services? Does four o'clock work for you? And the agency that just bills for the services and contracts with the worker is really left out of the conversation. So is that a yes or no to my question? I'm, I'm not clear. It's with, an, it depends and it's in the contract and it, I mean, it's, it could be part of a contractual relationship where hours are set. Uh, however, one of the key components of the independent contractor relationship is the flexibility. Uh, oftentimes, um, you the, the services are needed at night and it could go into late hours it could go into the weekend so the flexibility is key to the quality of life of the people who receive these services and that's what the contractual relationship provides uh, if you try to bring someone on board as a eight-hour employee normal business hours uh, that that would absolutely be a completely inefficient use of time because you would be, be unable to schedule uh, the services for all those who need the services during that eight hours period. Therefore, the contractual relationship is the ultimate uh, avenue to, to be able to, to effectively and efficiently provide these services. Mr. Mass, my second question? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Ms. State or, or Senator Curl, either one. My second question is this. Does the 1915C provider have the ability to dictate the, the type of work or the nature of the work that uh, the behavior support services, behavior programming services, case management services, community living support services, positive behavior support services, or respite services are provided. Do they control, does 1915C provider control the, 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 the uh, nature or the quality of work that's provided? Um. So that, again, will be dictated by the contract, generally speaking, and I can't speak for every contract because 
I don't write them or see them. But generally speaking, the contracts say you must follow all Kentucky regulations. Next we have Senator Wheeler. Thank you. Um, I, I guess, Ms. Staten, what, what, what if, and I'm just thinking outside the box, I mean, I can see some circumstances like I think uh, Senator Carroll, when he spoke to me earlier, mentioned a Michelle P. waiver, which is often a family member living in the household. Um, I, I mean, I could see that as being kind of a distinct situation from, you know, maybe somebody that's hired by a um, company that provides home health services to mentally handicapped individuals, sending them out to certain households. Um, I guess my question, I mean, because, you know, th this is life, things do happen. Well, what if... You know, I'm thinking of a scenario, somebody went out to, uh, to check on one of their patients, a mentally handicapped patient. What if they, you know, were attacked or something like that and, uh, by this patient and, and suffered grievous injuries? What, what would be their recourse under that scenario if they didn't have any workers' compensation? I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to that, but I will say uh, many of these independent contractors, because they are independent contractors, yeah, have always question. been independent contractors and have never been subject to unemployment insurance or workers' compensation, carry their own coverage. Okay. Thank um, you, Senator Girdler. If there's, if I understand, you know, I was going to answer your question, if they're self-employed, they got to have their own workers' comp insurance themselves because they're independent contractors. If, if you don't uh, have, and correct me, Miss Kimmy, uh, if if you don't have coverage, you're not required to have coverage if you are an independent contractor for yourself for uh, workers' comp or uh, or unemployment insurance. If me and you, if me and Philip Wheeler are in business together, we're not required to have that because we're self proprietors. So in that situation, uh, they're doing the contract. They would have to have their own workers' compensation themselves not not the people they're intended but contractor with what happens in these situations is that kimmy and other companies will come in and do an audit and they'll charge the contractor for everybody that don't, that don't show up that they don't have general liability or or workers comp well they're not required to have workers comp and so what's happening is they're getting charged for that chart, for that uh, amount of money that's being billed on. And it'd be no different if, if uh, Senator McDaniel does the same thing, an independent contractor, and they're trying to charge him for that. In audits, I've been through audits in 43 years in the insurance business, they ain't fun. <laughs> and, and believe me, uh, and there's one more thing I've got a thought here. How in the world do so many attorneys get on economic development? <laughs> uh, I don't think I'll allow motion, that when I'm Motion on the bill. <laughs> we have a motion from Senator Gerler. We have a second from Senator Mills. I did want to ask, and I think you both addressed this in uh, your opening comments, but if, if this bill is passed, will any of the agencies who, you know, are currently employing people go back to them and say, well, after this law, we, we think you're an independent contractor now? You foresee uh, that happening? Again, it, it protects the status quo. Those relationships are established where they're either employee and, and with some agency the the employee employer relationship works best for them in some it doesn't so it's not going to really affect that either way it, it will protect the status quo of where we are now and uh, it will be uh, the workers comp requirements will be consistent across the state for an industry that is struggling right now we we are going to lose providers through this uh, pandemic Thank you for the answer with that. Madam Secretary, if you would, please go to the roll. Senator Gardler. Aye. Senator Kerr. Senator Kerr, if you're still with us. I got the button pushed. Aye. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Senator McDaniel. Aye. Senator Mills. Aye. Senator Southworth. Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Yes, please. I vote aye. 
Um, this to me is an example of the entrepreneurs out there that I did represent at one time myself being in business. And, you know, I have a Michelle P constituent. I've got a 1915 cousin. I've got all kinds of these people. I understand, you know, the situations of what it looks like in real life. And I do take the legal perspective sometimes. And uh, to me, this is just a win-win on both sides to help everybody. Thank you. Senator Storm. Aye. Senator Thomas. Would you like to explain my no vote? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, th this debate uh, ha is, is one that's been around a long time and, and one that's, that's often explored in case laws as to when one is employee and when one is an independent contractor. Uh, and the courts generally use a, a five or six point test. But the two most important tests are, do you control the, the number of hours and, 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 and when that person works during those hours? And number two, do you control the, the, the nature and activity of their work? Uh, and based upon the answers to the questions I have today, if you sign a contract in which the person can control the hours that you work, and you sign a contract in which the person can dictate the activity and the nature of your work, then, then you really are not an independent contractor. Uh, you really are an employee. And it, and it seems to me that, you know, having these behavioral type specialists, you know, work these hours, some work late at night, as Senator Carroll has said, and then not be subject to unemployment compensation or not be subject to workers' compensa compensation, workers' comp compensation, or may not even be subject to minimum wage because they're excluded from wages. Uh, it's very harmful and goes in the wrong direction from what I'd like to see uh, the policy of the state uh, adopt. So therefore, I vote no. Senator Wheeler. Mr. Chairman, explain my vote. Yes, please. Um, I'm going to vote pass at this time. And... Um, I do have some concerns about, you know, whether or not uh, some, of, some of which were expressed by Senator Thomas that this could be expanded to um, essentially uh, force an independent contractor relationship on folks who might uh, not otherwise be deemed independent contractors. And, you know, I guess also I, I think that, um, you know, we kind of have a process anyway that you can file a uh, a waiver with the Department of Workers Claims asking to be excluded from workers' compensation coverage. So, I mean, it, it seems a little duplicative in, in, in that sense, but, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to study this further. I, I may get to yes, but I'm, 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 at the present time, I'm just not comfortable with, uh, with voting either no or yes on this bill. Senator Wilson. Aye. Senator Yates. Play my vote, please. Yes, please. Um, I, too, I'm going to follow Senator Wheeler's lead on, on um, voting the past vote. I did speak with Senator Carroll today, and um, I think there's a lot of positive things in this. Um, but hearing, um, I do have some reservations. I'd like to sit down and um, maybe call on some experts that I do know better and, and um, hammer this out. So for today, I vote pass. Chairman Schroeder. Thank you. I vote, I vote aye today as well, and the bill does pass will not be on consent with two pass votes and a, a no vote, but thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. And with that, we have a motion and we are adjourned. Thank you.